Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining. It's great to see so many people with us today. Um, so welcome to another HR Connect webinar where we break down complicated entitlements and obligations under the Fair Work Act into more easily digestible information. My name's Georgia and I'm a senior workplace advisor here within the HR Connect team. Hi, I'm Amy and I'm a workplace advisor in the HR Connect team. Great, so before we jump in everyone, some housekeeping to start us off today. As always, we've tried to pack as much content into our webinar in the short amount of time that we have. Uh, please post any of your questions in the Q&A function, not in the chat function. Um, if we do have time, we will be answering a few of these at the end. Um, but if we don't, we will be sending out a response sheet following the webinar for any questions that we didn't get to answer today. The webinar is being recorded um, and we will send out a link to those who all have registered for today following the webinar. If the webinar does inspire you to access any further HR support, we will have some contact details at the end for you to get in touch with our team. And finally, we do touch on the general process for mental health within the workplace. However, these matters can become quite complicated in certain circumstances, and not all scenarios will be straightforward. Sometimes it may be the case that you do need to seek independent legal advice. So now we'll move into an acknowledgement of country. HR Connect acknowledges Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first Australians and traditional custodians of the lands on which we work and live. We acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples continuing connection to country and pay our respect to their elders past, present and future. Today we'll be taking a look at mental health in the workplace and what your obligations are as an employer when managing this in your business. Mental health is an area that can arise in a multitude of contexts in the workplace and is a particularly difficult top topic for employees to navigate due to the complexity of the risks involved. Keep in mind that this process is exceptionally difficult to navigate and most times each situation carries its own unique risks and considerations. What we will be discussing today is what you can expect from these situations, but as always, if you have specific situation occurring in your business, we would recommend seeking further professional guidance on your matter to ensure you're implying these recommendations correctly. Further, some of the content we'll be discussing today will be particularly sensitive, such as discussions around mental health conditions in the workplace. So for any time you find this content, content triggering, please take the necessary steps to take care of yourself. Great, right, so now I'll kick things off and talk about our first topic for today, why mental health at work matters. So mental health includes our emotional, psychological and social well-being. It affects how we feel, think and act. It also helps determine how we handle stress, relate to others and make choices. Good mental health might involve general feelings of positivity and being able to cope with daily tasks, whilst at the other end of the spectrum, Poor mental health might involve a mental health condition such as depression or anxiety. A national survey conducted in 2022 on mental health and well-being in Australia revealed that 43.7% of individuals aged 16 to 85 had experienced a mental health disorder at some point in their lives. The impact within the workplace of this widespread mental health issue includes losses in productivity, increased absenteeism and higher support payments. Considering that people typically spend one third of their day at work, it does become evident that a negative work environment, unsupportive employers or toxic workplaces can significantly affect the mental health and well-being of employees. One of the simplest and most effective ways for employers to enhance mental health outcomes is by fostering awareness and reducing the stigma associated with mental health within their workplaces. Mental health also matters within the workplace because it relates to various pieces of legislation that all employers are covered by, such as workplace health and safety laws and anti-discrimination legislation that provides protections to employees with a disability. 
An employer has a legal obligation to ensure the health and safety of their workers. Recently, updated regulations around psychosocial safety have made it important for business owners to understand their obligations. These obligations are another lens for business owners to look at as mismanaging mental health can open up the business to certain claims being made, including workers' compensation. So now we'll go into some factors that can impact mental health within the workplace. Um, as we just went over, most people at some point in their lives will experience a mental health condition, either directly themselves or maybe in respect to a member of their family or a close friend or even a member within the team. Employees with mental health will be impacted by several factors, both within the workplace and outside the workplace. Some factors that are usually within the control of the employer to regulate can include the following. So the first one we've got is excessive demands and low control. So this can look like, um, you know, where there's excessive monitoring of work tasks or breaks, unpredictable work hours, precarious employment contracts, and work where workers have little to no involvement in the decisions that affect them and their work. The second one on the screen is poor support. So this refers to tasks or jobs where workers have inadequate emotional or practical support from their supervisors or co-workers. Inadequate training or information to support their work performance or inadequate tools, equipment or resources to do their job. Low reward and recognition. So the third one we have on the screen can include not being recognised for extra effort or commitment and receiving little to no constructive feedback. It may include not providing workers reasonable opportunities for career development, not recognising workers' skills or distributing rewards and recognition in a way that is unfair, biased or inequitable. Another example of risk factors within the workplace that can contribute to poor mental health include poor role clarity and job uncertainty. So poor role clarity refers to jobs where there is an uncertainty or frequent changes to tasks and work standards, where important task information may not be available to workers or where there are conflicting job roles or responsibilities. And job uncertainty refers to where an employee is uncertain if they're going to lose their job or they may feel threatened by their employer that their role is at risk of termination. So they're just some examples and factors that can contribute to poor mental health at work. Um, and they are only some examples. You can see on the screen we do have some additional factors that can impact the mental health of workers. Um, they're on the screen there. Now, the next slide that we'll go into is discussing the legal obligations and the risks associated with psychosocial safety within the workplace. So in 2011, Safe Work Australia took a significant step towards ensuring workplace safety and well-being by developing the model work health and safety laws, which were intended to be uniformly implemented throughout Australia. However, for these laws to gain legal authority, they needed to be separately adopted by the Commonwealth states and territories as part of their individual legislative frameworks. Consequently, each state and territory established their own work health and safety legislation and regulations, which outline specific requirements for managing psychosocial hazards within the workplace. Although these laws varied in some details, they all share a common foundation built upon three essential pillars, risk assessment, control measures and consultation and implementation strategies. The first pillar, risk assessment, emphasises the importance of identifying potential psychosocial hazards within the workplace. This step involves a thorough evaluation of various factors, such as workplace culture, job demands, and interpersonal relationships. Assessing this risk will help you work out what is reasonably practical to control it. To assess the risk of harm, you'll need to consider the work is affected, the duration, frequency, and severity of the exposure to the hazard. So for an example, 
Um, there may be a risk that you notice that your workers face high workloads or excessive job demands. So you should be considering which workers face the high workloads, how long those workloads last, and how often they experience high workloads, and also how excessive the workloads are. Once these hazards are identified, the second pillar, control measures, comes into play. So this involves the implementation of strategies and protocols designed to mitigate the identified risks. Such measures should include change to organizational policies, employee training programs, or the introduction of supportive resources to foster a healthier work environment. You must eliminate risk to health and safety if it is reasonably practical to do so. If it's not reasonably practical to eliminate the risks, then you must minimise the risk so far as reasonably practical. The third pillar, consultation and implementation, highlighted the significance of involving employees in the decision-making process regarding psychosocial hazards. It stresses open communication channels between employers and workers, ensuring that the concerns and insights of employees were acknowledged and addressed. By actively engaging employees in the process, companies could create a workplace culture that prioritizes mental health and well-being. To assist employers in adhering to these principles and discharging their legal obligations, each state and territory developed a specific psychosocial code of practice. This document served as a comprehensive guide offering practical advice and recommendations on how to effectively manage psychosocial hazards in various workplace settings. By following the guidelines outlined in the code of practice, employers could not only ensure compliance within the work health and safety laws, but also foster a positive work environment where employees feel valued, supported and safe. In summary, the development and implementation of the model work health and safety laws, along with subsequent creation of the state and territory specific legislation and the psychosocial code of practice, represented a crucial milestone in promoting mental health and well-being in Australian workplaces. Through the collaborative efforts of authorities, employers and employees, these regulations and guidelines have laid a foundation for safer, healthier and more supportive work environments across the nation. So understanding the complex nature of legal responsibilities to workplace health and safety can pose a challenge for business owners. It's not only crucial to have a clear awareness of these obligations, but to also grasp the potential risks and penalties that loom in any case of violations. Breaching these laws can lead to severe consequences, including financial penalties, legal liabilities and damages to your business's reputation. Therefore, it's crucial for business owners to not only understand what the legal obligations are, but also to proactively address them and implement robust safety measures and foster that culture of compliance to prevent any breaches that may carry adverse repercussions. So the first risk that we'll talk into is the one that's most commonly associated with injury at work, which is workers' compensation. Now, this has many risks. Um, and it's a significant risk to employers due to the financial implications associated with workplace illnesses or injuries. When employees are injured on the job, uh, they are entitled to workers' compensation benefits, which typically cover things like medical expenses, rehabilitation costs, and can also cover a portion of lost wages. For employers, um, what this can look like and translate into is increased insurance premiums and potential legal expenses if there are any disputes that may arise. Moreover, workplace accidents can you know, lead to productivity losses and increase operational costs, impacting the overall profitability of a business. And employers may also face the reputational damage of their workplace being perceived as unsafe, which could potentially affect customer trust and investor confidence. And additionally, uh, frequent workers' compensation claims could trigger more stringent regulatory scrutiny, potentially leading to fines and penalties. Thanks for all that, Georgia. We'll now look at penalties for breaching the Work Health and Safety Act. So, work health and safety legislation prescribes the fines for the breaches. 
The amount they find vary based on state penalty units. For example, $110 per one penalty in New South Wales. The severity of the breach categorizes it categorizes it as one, two, and three, which is determined by the court. Category one involves conduct with gross negligence or recklessness leading to the risk of death or serious injury or illness. Category two pertains to failing to comply with health and safety duty, exposing a person to the risk of death or serious illness or injury. Category three involves failing to comply with health and safety duty. As mentioned, the penalties vary depending on the category of the offence and the entity committing the breach, which can be classified as an individual, person conducting business or undertaking business, officer or body corporate. In cases of severe breaches, the possibility of imprisonment becomes a really serious factor. For example, maximum penalties in New South Wales are based on the penalty units and differ based on the offender's status. This can also be found in Section 31 of the Work Health Act. For an individual offence, which is excluding a person conducting business or officer, the maximum fine is 300000 with five years imprisonment. Penalties may include both the fine and imprisonment. An individual offence, um, which includes a person conducting business or officer, the maximum fine is 600000 with maximum imprisonment, again, as five years. Penalties, again, may include both fine and imprisonment. Offence by a body corporate is a maximum fine of $3 million. So now we're going to look at how to create a mentally safe workplace, a psychosociologically healthy and safe workplace is one that promotes mental health and well-being protects mental health by reducing work-related risk factors and actively prevents and addresses mental illness and injury from occurring. Generally, work activities can be positive for a person's psychosocially and mental well-being. However, there are aspects of the workplace that, if not appropriately managed, have the potential to negatively affect the individual's mental health, sense of well-being, physical health, as well as the effectiveness of an organisation to fulfil its operational requirements. There are strategies to promote a mentally safe workplace, which include that the business promotes awareness and reduces stigma associated with mental health. This can be achieved through educational programs, workshops, open discussions that encourage employees to talk about their mental health concerns, fostering a supportive and inclusive environment, employers should ensure that their policies and procedures are inclusive and respectful of employees' mental health needs, providing access to mental health resources and support services such as EAP is really important, and employee assistance program is a voluntary and confidential service to help employees at all levels who have personal concerns that affect their personal well-being and or performance. EAPs are typically typically offered by employers to help their employees address a wide range of issues, such as stress, mental health concerns, substance abuse, family problems, financial difficulties, and more. Employment Innovations are able to provide EAP service through our partner EAP service, Acacia. So reach out to us if you're looking to join an EAP service. We also recommend encouraging work-life balance. Employees can promote this by implementing flexible work arrangements, encouraging employees to take breaks and setting realistic workloads. We suggest preventing workplace bullying and harassment. The business should look to clearly implement clearly defined anti-bullying and harassment policies and clearly outline the processes for employees to take if they're experiencing bullying and harassment at work. And this could be such as a grievance process. We encourage promoting physical health as well. So physical health can positively impact mental well-being. This can include encouraging regular physical activity, providing healthy snacks, and creating a workspace that encourages movement. Finally, we move on to leadership and management support, which are really essential. Leaders should actively engage in mental health initiatives, lead by example, and encourage open communication. Regular check-ins with employees can also provide really valuable insights into their well-being and open and honest dialogue with staff can promote support for anyone in the business who is needing 
help with the endorsed safety net of trusting that no adverse action will be taken against employees experience mental illness. No matter which strategy you take away from this webinar, remember that mentally safe workplaces are not only crucial standard for your employees, but they also hold positive benefits for business owners. This benefit can include less staff absenteeism and lost working days, increased productivity, greater job satisfaction, reduced staff turnover, and you attract more talented workers. Thanks for that. Um, as we have discussed strategies for creating a mentally safe workplace, we'll now look at into how to approach communication on mental health. One way to promote mental health communication is through mental health awareness training programs. Such initiatives can help employees learn how to recognize mental health difficulties arising in themselves, you know, in a colleague or even in a family member and seek help and support when necessary. Such programs also provide a platform for open conversations about mental health, allowing coworkers to share their own experiences feelings and any other related topics in a safe environment. Another method of promoting mental health communication in the workplace is by having mental health resources available. As Amy mentioned, um, an employee assistance program is a great resource and tool for employees to use and access. Um, it provides them access to counselling services and even you know, to support groups as well. So this type of initiative does demonstrate an employer's commitment to their employees' mental well-being, enabling them to get timely assistance and prevent that potential burnout or absenteeism that can arise due to poor mental health. And finally, um, it is important for employees and co-workers alike to be mindful when discussing mental health difficulties so that they do not pass the blame or judgment. As a team and an organisation, everyone should demonstrate a commitment to creating an atmosphere where those who are struggling feel comfortable discussing their symptoms and the impact of these without fear, judgment or shame. Education around this topic is key so that staff can be aware of what constitutes appropriate language when talking about mental health so as to avoid discrimination and foster more open communication around the topic within the workplace. Thanks again, Georgia. So now we'll be moving into managing performance concerns of workers who have mental health conditions. There are a few scenarios where an employer may need to juggle an employee's mental health concerns at the same time as needing to performance manage them. This may occur when an employee with a known condition experiences a correlating decline in their work performance when they experience a decline in their mental state. You may also see an employee who has an unknown condition disclose they have one during or after a performance management process, such as if they claim the stress of the performance management process has triggered the condition. This is a really delicate area and we always recommend seeking specialist professional advice if you're dealing with an employee who suffers from mental illness or related conditions. As with any performance matter, we recommend meetings and discussions are documented. We'll now be moving on to how to identify causes of underperformance. Whether or not employees have known condition or not, when employees are underperforming, they will generally not be fulfilling their job responsibilities properly or exhibiting unacceptable behaviour at the work at, on some level. This can include not meeting work standards or not completing tasks as required, displaying inappropriate behaviour or negativity in the workplace, such as hostility towards customers, increased number of complaints, either coming from customers or colleagues, targets or objectives not being met or missing deadlines, or poor quality in the work completed. This can be an incredibly complex time for a business as navigating what is underperformance and what is incapacity due to a medical condition can be a really fine line to tread. It can be difficult to know when an employee's outputs and behaviours are isolated performance concerns and when it may be related to their mental health. Sometimes we hear about an employee exhibiting behaviour that is referred to them as underperforming when it may actually be a matter of them not being able to fulfil certain requirements of their role due to medical incapacity. 
To give you an example of what I mean, if an employee in a customer service role is unable to deliver positive and inspiring experiences to clients because they were diagnosed with severe depression and were therefore not performing a requirement of their role. As a first step, we would recommend holding an informal meeting to talk about possible causes of the decline in performance. Make sure to provide clear examples of the issues as vague descriptions of general behaviour may be difficult for the employee to interpret and respond to. So it's really important to consider the broader circumstances such as for new employees, a lack of training might be an issue or poor role clarity. For longer term employees who have previously performed really well, a sudden change in their business environment, such as a merger or acquisition, may be really disruptive. We also suggest undertaking a wellbeing check in to discuss personal challenges or concerns about process changes, such as asking if the employee, if there are any factors outside of the work or if there are any, if there are any worsened medical conditions the business should be aware of. And if a mental health condition is disclosed, approach the employee with empathy and support and ask if there is anything the business can do to better accommodate their needs. A second step may be necessary in more complex cases. So such as if an employee has a long-term reoccurring or severe mental health issue, we recommend seeking professional advice to ensure you have much as much information as possible to make informed decisions around how and when the employee will be managed appropriately. It may be reasonable for the business to explore a medical assessment undertaken by a treating practitioner to assist with identifying the extent to which the employee's mental health condition impacts their performance of their work and gain some really good insight into the prognosis and timeframes. The practitioner can also provide adjustments that support both mental wellbeing and productivity. When you receive this medical assessment, you will need to discuss with the employee on the recommended steps and changes in their role. Given these documents are usually quite detailed and specific, we recommend seeking special, specialist advice from a legal team or psychosocial safety expert on how to implement the medical advice. We also have some really good suggestions to follow when engaging in initial step stage strategies to support the employees, which include advising the employee of a specific performance issue, how they are affecting the business, compare current performance to expected performance or behaviour, avoid comparing the employee with other employees, provide constructive feedback rather than pointing out mistakes, show empathy, be a positive listener, offer training or ask what, you, what support or training may help them. Ask the employee for commitment or improvement and establish how and when to follow up on the commitments. Encourage the employee to keep open lines of communication for future discussion and ensure appropriate meeting panelists are present with all conversations, including ones that the employee has positive relationships with. You may want to avoid unfair ratios, such as having one employee sitting with three managers. You should also ask the employee for their feedback on strategies that work for them. For example, they might find um, morning meetings more productive and afternoons don't really work as well for their feedback sessions. Or they might require cooperation from family members to support them in the process. We do have some case law um, kind of go along with this. So in cases where informal approaches don't see any changes in the employee's performance, the consideration for formal action may become necessary. One approach recommended is to invite the employee to a formal performance management meeting, a step that ensures clarity by confirming the areas to be discussed. But it's really important to stress that when implementing formal actions, we need to approach these employees with empathy and offer reasonable adjustments. The significance of this consideration becomes really evident when we examine the case of Thomas Vernon and the Checo Corporation. In this instance, an employee who had exhibited serious workplace misconduct, including sending threatening emails with violent content and death threats, found himself at the centre of an unfair dismissal ruling. The Fair Work Commission determined that the forklift driver's mental illness was a mitigating factor and that his employee, employer should have taken their mental health condition into account when taking action. 
It's really important to note the employer argued they were unaware of the employee's medical condition, but Fair Work reached a different conclusion, finding that the employer had sufficient information about the employee's medical health, and that was enough to warrant inquiries into his mental state. The employer was ordered to pay 42000 in compensation, which was reduced to 40% to reflect the employee's serious misconduct. These decisions highlight the need for a kind and well-informed approach when taking formal actions with employees who might be dealing with mental health conditions. Thanks for that. So as we have now discussed illness and injury within the workplace and also the potential penalties and risks associated with this in the workplace, um, another factor business owners will need to consider is reasonable adjustments to the worker's job so that they can perform their duties um, with their disability if they do suffer from one. So this concept of reasonable adjustments reflects the understanding that a worker with a disability can often perform tasks if adjustments are made to accommodate the effects of their disability. The definition, however, of disability is very broad it's our view that it would encompass an employee suffering a mental health condition such as depression or anxiety. The aim of any reasonable adjustment within the workplace is to minimise the impact of their disability to enable the worker to fully take part in work-related programs and effectively undertake the inherent requirements of their role. In order to make reasonable adjustments for the worker, the inherent requirements of the job need to be understood. The inherent requirements of the role relate to what needs to be accomplished in the job rather than how it is accomplished. The focus should be on how the person's disability affects their ability to undertake their work and what adjustments can be made to overcome this. Reasonable adjustments are personalised and they should be tailored to meet individual requirements and circumstances. The worker that you're dealing with will be able to understand their availabilities and what restrictions they have and also how often um, they are also the best person to advise what adjustments are needed. So as you can see on the screen, we do have some examples of reasonable adjustments. So the first one we've got is physical adjustments. So this could be modifying the work site or workstation to make it accessible, um, changing the workspace and providing additional um, equipment or tools. The second one is work arrangements. So this could be adjustments to the work hours or duties such as part-time work. Could be starting and finishing later, working from home or, you know, assistance in managing that workload. Um, the next one we've got is adjustments to the job. Again, this could be modifying duties, um, providing additional training, modifying work patterns. And the last one we have there is technological assistance. Now, this could be providing new or modifying existing equipment and tools. An example of this could be, you know, speech recognition software. What is considered reasonable, however, it does depend on the facts and circumstances of each case. The Disability Discrimination Act 1992 requires employers to make reasonable adjustments so a person with a disability is able to perform the inherent requirements of the job unless this would cause unjustifiable hardship to the employer. The case Tropolis vs Journey Lawyers involved a lawyer who was unable to work due to a worsening pre-existing depression, um, condition of depression, sorry. The employer sought to recommence work after six months of absence and his employer offered several adjustments to accommodate his return. The employer consulted with the employee's treating practitioners and the employee was offered ample recovery time additional leave and working schedule of three full alternate days. This arrangement meant that the employee had reduced earnings and responsibilities, his office was relocated and the nature of his work had changed. The employee rejected the offer and brought a claim of unlawful discrimination under Section 5.2 of the Disability Discrimination Act 1992. In the assessment, the court balanced the competing needs of the employee and the business. Ultimately, the court found no breach of the law. The employee's demands, including half days and reinstatement of previous duties, salary and office would have created unjustifiable hardship in practice. 
particularly given the limited resources of the small firm. This decision does highlight the importance of supporting and making reasonable adjustments for staff within mental health issues, but it does not require employers to act in a manner that would cause unjustifiable hardship to them. Where an employee has a mental health condition and it is found that maybe there is no reasonable adjustments that can be made to assist them in performing the inherent requirements of the role, it may be that there will be an ability to start the process that culminates the termination of the employee's employment because they can no longer perform the inherent requirements of the job. However, this should be only a last resort option and will only be possible to do where there is strong medical evidence to support the fact the employee's condition is unlikely to improve in the immediate future. In addition, workers' compensation legislation definitely generally prevents an employee's employment from being terminated until a set period of time from the date of the workplace injury. These time frames, time frames differ between states and territories and professional advice should always be sought when you're looking at potentially terminating someone's employment who's on workers' compensation or dealing with an illness or injury. Yeah, definitely. So now we'll touch on some health and safety factors and measures a business should consider when managing employees who are diagnosed with mental illness. A business will have a duty of care to employees while they are at work. So if you have reasonable suspicion a worker is at risk of harming themselves on site, Sane Australia identifies three basic steps to assist. So the first one's let them know you are concerned and that you're there to help. You can ask if they are thinking about suicide and if they have made any active plans to do so. Remember, talking about suicide will not make them take action. Asking shows that you care. Asking will help them talk about their feelings and plans. We also recommend considering implementing business strategies, such as putting management and supervisory staff through mental health first aid training and awareness courses. This will help to lift the stigma and equip your staff with the capability to know how to respond. And again, we recommend reconsidering your policies on psychosocial safety. The business should also develop a mental health policy that outlines support and accommodations and resources available. Other things that could be done could be introducing programs like mindfulness or EAP access, as mentioned earlier to get higher managers to speak up to reduce stigma and foster an environment where seeking help is really encouraged rather than put down. The managers should also create um, regular check-ins to help maintain open conversations and identify issues early and provide resources such as to offer contact details for mental health professionals and helplines. Thanks for that one. Now we're going to move into debunking some common myths about supporting employees with mental health conditions. So the first one we have on the screen is that people with mental health conditions can't function within the workplace. So myth one does perpetuate a face, false belief that individuals with mental health issues are unable to function effectively in a professional working environment assuming they lack productivity, social skills, and the capacity to lead fulfilling work lives. This misconception is problematic for employees in the workplace as it can lead to their isolation and exclusion, eroding their sense of belonging and overlooking their valuable skills and strengths. The truth is that people with mental health conditions possess unique talents and are fully capable of actively participating in various aspects of life. In the workplace, these individuals can be great colleagues, employees and contributors, demonstrating intelligence, education, productivity and community involvement. Yeah. So myth two is people are to blame for their own mental health problems. This myth unfairly places the onus on individuals for their mental health challenges. It is often used to place blame, creating a false sense of immunity for those who hold the negative belief while discouraging them from actively um, assisting others. In this instance, it's used to rationalise exclusion, discrimination, prejudice, and can negatively impact employees in their professional and personal lives. The reality is that mental health problems can stem from various causes, and the affected individuals should not be held accountable. 
Common mental health issues like depression and anxiety and substance abuse problems can affect almost anyone and their symptoms are not only a matter of choice of control. Employees with mental health challenges cannot simply snap out of it or do better, nor are they seeking attention or making excuses. Many mental health illnesses are influenced by hereditary, genetic, neurological or biological factors, while external, uncontrollable environmental factors can make them worse. With appropriate support and treatment, most employees can effectively manage their mental health conditions and leave productive, fulfilling work lives. And the third myth we will be debunking is talking about mental health problems in the workplace can make them worse. So this myth often stemmed from well-intentioned but misplaced concerns in the workplace. People may fear that discussing mental illnesses, crises or suicide could inadvertently plant distressing ideas in someone's mind. Worries about using wrong words or causing offence can lead to silence on these topics. Employees may avoid addressing mental health problems, believing it will create discomfort for themselves and others. However, the counterproductive aspects of avoiding open conversations about mental health and suicide within the workplace is that it perpetuates stigma, discourages employees from seeking support that they need, and tells those with mental health issues to keep their struggles hidden and impedes progress in addressing mental health on both individual and communal levels. The reality is that engaging in thoughtful and safe conversations about mental health and suicide is more beneficial than detrimental. To do this effectively, it's essential to use appropriate language and educate oneself on effective communication. Encouraging these discussions at work can significantly contribute to improving mental health literacy and normalising mental health challenges, life difficulties and help-seeking behaviours. This in turn reduces stigma and dismantles barriers to support. Building positive connections and fostering a sense of belonging can have profound impact on employees facing mental health challenges or nav navigating difficult times. Yeah. So now we're going to move on to some frequently asked questions. Uh, one that we get a lot of is what leave entitlements can my employee access? So the first one is usually personal carers leave, also known as sick leave. Personal leave, also known as sick leave or carers leave, is designed to provide paid time off for employees who are unwell or caring for family members in a house or a household member who is ill. This leave can be used for mental health conditions. The next we have annual leave, which is also known as paid vacation leave. Employees may use their annual leave to take a break from work and manage their mental health. The availability of annual leave and the process for requesting it will depend on the terms of employment, the employment contracts or their reward. And then there is unpaid leave. If an employee's paid leave entitlement is exhausted, you can agree to allow the employee to take a period of unpaid leave. Great. Um, the second FAQ that we'll move into is, do employees have to disclose a mental health condition to the business? So you can ask employees to share medical information that would affect their ability to perform their role. However, a worker is not legally obligated to disclose information about their disability. While you may find this frustrating, disclosure is often a difficult choice for a worker to make. A worker may choose to not disclose their mental illness to you, even when it is evident that they're not coping in the workplace. Even though legally they do not need to disclose medical conditions, if you do have the scenario where an employee deliberately fails to disclose a relevant medical condition in a pre-employment questionnaire, such actions may potentially warrant termination of their employment but it is important to reach out for assistance before taking such action to avoid any potential discrimination risk. Yeah. So the next question is, can an employee request accommodations for continued work? Yes, as spoken about previously, employees have the right to ask for accommodations like flexible work hours or other adjustments to sustain their employment. Again, anti-discrimination laws mandate employers to reasonably adapt to workplace accommodate 
and, and accommodate impairments, the accommodation should not place any undue burden on the employer. While discussing these matters can be really challenging, understanding the employee's specific needs is really important. This understanding aids the business in making practical adjustments that enable the employee to work effectively. Great. So thank you everyone for joining today. We obviously went through a lot of information. Um, as we did like do a quick disclosure at the start, um, some of this information could be triggering to some people. So on the slide here, we have popped in some mental health support resources. Um, if, you know, you or yourself or a colleague of yours is feeling, you know, depressed, stressed or anxious about anything that we discussed today, um, there are some great resources on the screen above to help you. Um, so yeah, that's great. Um, we do have a lot of questions that have popped up. So um, that's all the content that we have for today, but I'll move into the Q&A function. There's been a lot there um, today. So thank you guys for participating. So the first question I can see that we can answer is, do we have mental health policies or templates? Uh, yes, we definitely do um, with, in our subscriptions to HR Connect. Um, if you are a current client of HR Connect and you don't have this policy, definitely reach out. If you're not a current client and you were interested in, you know, talking to someone about accessing the policies and also what our subscription entails, definitely reach out to the team um, and we can, you know, have a chat with you about what that would look like. Um, the next question I was going to look at answering is what does psychosocial mean? And it is being used a lot. So we use psychosocial in the term of, and especially psychosocial hazards, it's anything that could potentially cause psychological harm to someone's mental health. Um, so it's really looking at mental health risks in the workplace and hazards um, and also how they can cause that harm. Mm -hmm. um, we can look. The next one, can we request an employee to go to a doctor that you want? Um, if you are in a position where you're looking at sending your employee to get a medical assessment done, um, it's really up to how a conversation goes with the employee. You know, if you if they haven't disclosed to you, I think there's another question here that says if they haven't disclosed, they have a medical condition, but you can tell that, you know, something might be going on. We'd always recommend to, you know, start with an informal chat and just say, look, you know, hey, we want to speak to you. Um, we've noticed a couple of comments or, like, actions that you've been taking and you just don't, like, seem like yourself lately. Um, is there anything going on that obviously we need to be aware about? Because we want to make sure that, you know, you can perform your job and that you we have a safe environment for you at the workplace. If at that point they say, look, you know, yeah, I've been feeling like very depressed or I've been having a lot of anxiety lately, anxiety lately I'm feeling really stressed out. Um, and they aren't really seeking any medical help or, you know, you know they're not really doing anything about it. Um, and it continues on and on and on, then it may be at a point where you do have a chat with them about going and getting a medical assessment done. Um, you can obviously say to them whatever you'd feel comfortable with. We can either book the appointment for you at an independent person or you can go to a doctor of your choice. It's really whatever, you know, is feeling most comfortable for them. Um, so it really, like, that one really depends on, I guess, the situation and how your conversation with the employee goes. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of couple of personal questions in here. Um, so we may not be able to answer those ones. Again, what can be done if they won't admit that they have a mental health issue? All you can do is, like I said, create that environment where they feel comfortable to speak to you about what's going on. So if you're noticing like the performance is dropping and they're traditionally a really good worker or they're taking a lot of time off, just have that conversation with them and don't come at them in a way that's like, you know, you're not performing or you're taking all this time off. You want to go with an approach of like, you know, 
we're worried about you. Like we want to speak to you and make sure you're okay because there's been a couple of things that have happened that are very out of the ordinary for you. Um, yeah. And I want you to feel safe that you can speak to us about, you know, anything that's going on. We just want to make sure you're okay to be at work. Going out in that approach is really, like, you're going to get a really good response back um, because they're not going to feel like, you know, they're being performance managed or attacked or anything like that. There's going to be that honest, open communication. So it's really important that you create that within the workplace and then it would hopefully transpire if you have an employee that's suffering from a mental health condition. Yeah, I can see another question in there. Can a medical assessment be acquired if there's no claim? Um, I'm assuming that that's a workers' compensation claim. Yes, you can um, get a medical assessment done if you have reasonable grounds to do so. And you do need to be really mindful um, that of the Discrimination Act and making sure you aren't asking an employee without those reasonable grounds behind you to do so. So you kind of need to see what those reasonable grounds could be, such as what we mentioned um, today is if you can really see that they are struggling and that they're not being able to perform the role, that's when you can really step in in those complex cases if they do have um, disclosed medical conditions and it's been ongoing and it's really starting to perfect their performance, that's when you can um, look at getting an independent medical assessment done. Right. And the last one, I'll probably answer for today, but don't worry, guys, we'll get the rest out to you in a sheet after the webinar. Um, is the first one we had from Jody Durfer here. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, how do you address, assess culture, relationships, and the like as they change from employee to employee and are intangible? How do you identify the risks and mitigate? How do you ensure managers have open communication? So I think the first one, how are you assessing culture, relationships, and, you know, identifying any risks um, is you could conduct in a tool that we have through HR Connect um, through one of the products that we do offer through Employment Hero is um, you can do like monthly pulse surveys or happiness surveys. Um, so this is an anonymous survey that you can send out to all your staff and it basically gets them to rate their happiness out of one to 10. Um, and also gives them an opportunity to anonymously you know, say how they're feeling. Um, from there, you can kind of have a look at, you know, the culture. You can have a look, have a look at any things that may be going on that, at a management level, you might not be aware of. Um, addressing the culture as well, like if you from the top start creating those, having those conversations, and start creating that environment where, you know, you're going to be open about mental health, um, then it should hopefully go down as well as management like you should be doing and participating in those training educational pieces for your management so they know how to you know spot the signs of maybe staff that are suffering from mental health issues or you know how to have those conversations um with the risk and how to identify that you could look at doing like using a risk assessment tool where you're essentially you know looking and identifying the risks within the workplace um, we have a great tool that we use through the HR Connect subscription um, that really delves into, you know, a lot of different parts of the business and where those risks might be. And then from there, once you've identified the risks, you can kind of create a plan to controlling them and implementing and reviewing them. So, yeah, um, like we did mention, if you are kind of wanting some further assistance or anything like that um, from the HR Connect team or you're just kind of stuck and you don't know where to go to, definitely reach out to us. Um, but, yeah, thank you so much for joining today. Um, it was lovely to have everyone participate as well and hope to see you next time. Yeah, thanks, everyone.